Greetings, dear ones. I'm Cryan of Magnetic Service. My partner steps aside. There are those who can see it. Just as he said. That it's not actually a gift of second sight when a human being can see multidimensional attributes. It's intuitive to the human and what they are supposed to be able to see except the ones who have trained themselves out of it. And so there are those who can see the colors and you would see my partner as one of them. His essence moves aside. It doesn't go in the other room. It doesn't go away. It is not a takeover of the human body. Channeling is an honoring of the higher self in combination to the corporeal self in a meld that is a partnership of appreciation and awareness. And this is the way it is supposed to work. So that the corporeal self and the innate, which is your smart body, can cooperate with the intellect, with the language with a linear translation of a multi-dimensional concept. And that's who I am. My partner is an engineer. He liked puzzles and circuits. And that's not a mistake. For when it came time to iron out all of these issues that he had, regarding the spiritual part of himself and he drove himself to to a place that would be able to translate the concepts of spirit pouring through his pineal he turned to what he knew structured that which had to be structured and he moved within a system that he created that would linearize the quantumness of God. And he practiced it. It's another language, really. For we don't speak like this. If we did, more would do it like this. Now when you write, it's different. Because you can write things that come in as concepts and take the time to get it on paper. But when you speak it at the same time it's coming in, you're a translator. And so everything that follows is coming in in real time. As my partner steps aside and looks at it. And the subject is this. The recalibration of belief. And we're going to talk about belief systems today, but that's not what's going to recalibrate. It's not the doctrine that's going to recalibrate itself, dear ones, of those who are religious or not religious, or part of groups or not part of groups. It is the belief of something else that is even more dramatic that's going to occur. It's all part of changing what we would call normal. And so we want to bring you this message, one that is very similar to the one we brought yesterday. In a way that is succinct so that you can understand it. So we've got to start with some statements. I want to share with you a fact. And I always want you to return to this fact. What was the most intuitive thought of humans in the very earliest of days before recorded history about God? What did they think? What did they do? Uh, humans create construct for everything because it's comfortable. And there is no judgment of the constructs that they must create in order to move from one box to another. They like to create hierarchies because that is the way they live, that is their consciousness. And so that is all normal. 
Right now on the planet, approximately 80 to 85 percent of humanity believes in the afterlife. Almost all of the religions on the planet, over 99 percent, are monotheistic. You might say there is an agreement among humans at a basic level that they belong to God. And so they have split out, however, into many kinds of beliefs about the one God. And it's brought you to some interesting places. And we're going to talk about that, for not everything is as it seems. The Hindus say that they have the oldest religion on the planet. That's not so. But let's say it is. <laughs> because to say otherwise would then have to the, reveal the, the things that there is no evidence of. And it's a lot easier to go with what they say and honor what they say. And if you look at what they believe, it may be confusing because it would appear that they have many gods. The very fact is they do not. They are monotheistic as well, but they have many faces of God. They've compartmentalized the energies of one God into many. And in the process, it helps them. If you take a look at what some of those do, who are modern religious leaders and followers, they will have little trinkets, they will have angels, they would have perhaps even saints dangling from their, from their vehicles. It's not gods, it's parts and pieces of what helps them to put together their safety, their structure, and their belief. Now I want to tell you the attitude of God toward all of this. And I'm going to start the channel with that. And we have said this before. I want you to remember this. I want you to remember this more than you remember anything else. And I'll say it once again. I want you to feel the love and the beauty and the compassion of the statement when we say we don't care how you come to find the God inside you. We are not invested in the dynamics of structure like you are. There is a mind of God that you cannot fathom. It is not the mind of the human. It is no structure. It is pure compassion, light and love. It streams from the center of your galaxy as well as others all hooked together in a mysterious way that creates the Creator. It does not have judgment. It does not have anger. It doesn't even have expectation. It simply loves. And this is what's inside you. Blessed is the human who finds God in any organization, in any way, with any doctrine, and gets closer to the truth of who they are. Who sings the songs in any way they want to. And feels the joy of the love of God in their heart as they sing. For God is there. And as proof of this, I challenge you to disprove this. There are healings in every single organization on the planet. All of them. When humans turn to the core, the process is identical and consciousness takes over, not doctrine, and the healings are there. And they occur in synagogues and in mosques, in temples, in church, in the jungles where there is no doctrine at all. And that's the truth. Now let us go from there. 
If you look at the, at the belief systems of the original organizations on the planet, the intuitive thoughts that came first before anything else, you'll see it in the Hindus and the Buddhists. The oneness of all, the monotheistic God, the idea of past lives, the idea of cumulative learning, karma, ascension, a human being who is so ascended that they cannot even tell which life they're in. All original thought. I want you to remember that. Because that's the way it started. From there it became disseminated. Human beings like to take that which happens, assign meanings to it, and then go from there. It is so interesting, is it not, if you look at the masters who walked the earth. And you take a look at Jesus. He did not write the doctrine of today. His followers did. Did you know there was dissension among his followers? About who he was, what it meant, what he did, what they should do. It wasn't necessarily clear cut. All he did was to show who you could be. Every action in every word he said you were the sons of God like him and he was right and he was loved do you realize the impact of Muhammad do you realize he did not write his doctrine his followers did do you realize that both Jesus and Muhammad are responsible for over one billion followers each on the planet? And that they each represent a different kind of culture that would be attracted to them? Do you realize how much they have in common? Do you realize they're both of the lineage of Abraham? Dearly loved both of them. And here to show examples. Muhammad was about unity. He spoke to the angel in the cave who gave him the instructions that he carried out flawlessly and changed the earth and the Arab world because he followed the instructions. They love him for that. But he didn't write his doctrine. It is interesting, is it not, what human beings do when they see the mastery of God within a human being and how they fall upon their knees and they decide to worship the human instead of what he taught. But this is the box that you choose to put yourself in all over the world. When you look at the kinds of things that you believe and the vast differences of them. There is going to be a change of belief. And the belief is not about the doctrines. And it's not about the prophets. The belief that's going to change. Is about how they can mesh together. In compassionate action. Of tolerance. I want to, I want to give you an example. Right now, if you look at the Middle East, you're not seeing what the prophets said would take place. For right now, there is war. There is death even today. There is sorrow and death. It seems inappropriate. And it's not in Israel. <laughs> Right where the prophets said it would be. It's in Egypt. In Syria. And it's just the beginning. And it doesn't make any sense. Let's tell you for a moment what is going on there. What is not going on there. For this is interesting and it shows the shifts that we are discussing. The Israelis and the Arabs don't get along. 
And you might say, well, they have very different doctrines. Not really. Well, they have a different lineage. Not really. Did you know that when an Arab is in a foreign land, in order to eat properly, he will go find Jewish kosher food? <laughs> because the rules of eating are the same. The lineage is the same. And they hate each other. Now this was the catalyst of what I will call an old karmic earth. That's where the battle was going to be. That's where the Armageddon would begin. And the hills would run red with blood at the Temple Mount. Where it would all come together. And that won't happen. Muhammad ascended there, you know that. Revered by the Jews for Abraham, almost sacrificed Isaac at the same spot. Revered by the Christians, for that's where Jesus walked. Isn't it interesting? Sacred to them all. Why is there so much hatred? If you want to know the truth, it's not about doctrine at all. It's not about religion at all. It's about history. <laughs> history has created the rift. They don't like each other. Because of who did what to whom, where, who owns what land, what's going to happen next. Who deserves, who does not deserve. History. Now what if I told you, dear ones, that that's going to change soon. Soon to me does not mean soon to you. Well, let me tell you about it. There would be those who would say it cannot change. It is so old. It is so divisive. It is so filled with politics and hatred that it can never be solved. I'm going to look at you and I'm going to say, oh, really? I would like to present something to you you should hear. How do you feel, American, about Japan? And how do they feel about you? And what did you do to each other? And the answer is this, best friends. There are still Japanese alive that remember the Holocaust in their land from the nuclear fallout. There are still Americans alive who remember what it was like to have an attack on their land. There are those living that remember the horror of war on the islands and your best friends. Now how did that happen? And I'll tell you there was a healing over a generation or even less that occurred because it could, because consciousness allowed it to, because you didn't hold a grudge and you moved forward. There are a lot of Jews in Germany and they like it there. Their parents lived there. How do you think they feel about that country? How do you think the rest of Europe feels about them? You take a look at they are the strongest nation in the European Union. Best friends. Now you say, how could that happen? And it did. And it only took a generation. Now I'll go back to the Middle East for a minute. Do you see where I'm going with this? The generation that is being developed right now in the young people under 30 in the Middle East all have one thing in common and I'll tell you there is a new consciousness that is under the hood that you're not going to hear from any leader ever because the leaders are the elders they're not on Facebook Israelis are talking to Palestinians, they're talking to Iranians, and they're all agreeing, once we get control, we don't want war. We want the good things. 
We want hospitals that work and insurance that works. We want, we want the things that the other people have. We want health, schools, abundance where it's appropriate, good food, and friendship. The last thing we want is annihilation. And I want to tell you that is a change in belief. Can you imagine a time where an Iranian could visit Israel and have a good time <laughs> and vice versa? Where the independent state of Palestine would have an airport that worked with open borders with its neighbors that it never understood could be friends. And I will tell you that is what I see and that is going to happen and it may take two generations but it is in the works. That's the difference between the old energy of annihilation and nuclear war and hatred and the trigger of a holocaust and the new generation of energy starting in 2013 that is going to move this planet toward peace. And it's going to be slow. Social networking is the key we told you it would be. We also told you that there's going to be another explosion in the Middle East that is of a cultural kind and it's still on target and it's going to be Iran. And it may not be of the, of the kind that you see in Syria. It may happen easier, even faster. But consciousness is like that. It creeps forward until it reaches a tipping point of intolerance, of what the way things are. Ask a Syrian how long it took for them not to like the way things are. Ask an Egyptian, why now, after all these years? The politics is confusing. It's no longer black and white because there is an added feature of integrity that has never been there before. Imagine integrity in government. Imagine integrity in politics. That you do things out of compassion instead of political proprietariness. <laughs> it's a change in belief. The Catholic Church is huge. We told you you would lose a pope. In 2012, we warned you it was coming, and it did. And it happened in a way you did not expect. It begins a change in belief, and it's not necessarily doctrinal. The belief is going to be in the tolerance of things that before were intolerable. Look at the words of the new pope. Starting to talk about even the things in scripture in Leviticus that said one thing and he's saying another. The Holy See is beginning to see. <laughs> and when he sits in the chair of ex cathedra, don't be surprised if he gets messages from God about how you can compassionately change the church in tolerance for all that is around them like the never before. The fundamentalists you would meet in the street in this city loves his savior. And you can feel the love of God in him. It's the same love of God you feel when you are next to that which you know is the creator and you share that, dear ones. But what is next for him is what is next for you. There's coming a time when the monotheistic God will be seen as a tree of life. And in this tree, there is a massive, beautiful, loving trunk with roots into the ground that cover literally the earth. And the branches above 
branching out into so many cultures, so many faces, and the Hindus are there, and the Buddhists are there, and the Catholics are there, and the Jews are there, and the fundamentalist Christians are there, and many others are there. Ones you've never heard of in the jungles are there. But there is an agreement that the trunk is the core. And that every single human has the right to go their own direction and love God in their own way. And it doesn't change the branches, dear ones. It changes how they feel about the trunk. It's about a compassionate action that is going to occur on this planet where they look at the rest of humanity and they say, your way is not our way. But we'll live next to you. And we can appreciate it. That you're part of the same trunk we are. God is good. And that is a change of belief. A softening of judgment. Turning away from the doctrine being the only way. And instead understanding that the doctrines are the way that they wish them to be for their comfort and their belief. A softening of the idea that you can worship any way you want to and still be part of the trunk. And some of you will say, impossible, we've looked at the doctrines. We've looked at the doctrines. And doctrines, some of the doctrines are, are so clear in what they say, you, you cannot go to heaven unless you do this or you that or that or that. Cannot go. Someone would say, well, the doctrines have to change. And we say to you, no, they don't. They can soften and still be there. How do you feel about the Japanese? Did history change or did you? I want to ask a Jew, how do you feel about the Germans? Did history change or did you? And there'll come a day when I can look at the doctrines, you might say, and say, did the doctrines change or did you? That's the change of belief. We give this message in love and not wishing to offend any belief anywhere because God doesn't care how you find him and her. <laughs> doesn't matter. You have a piece of God in you and every single human looks for it from birth. Some of you have decided it's not there and you go your way. 80% have decided it's very, very much there and have come to their own conclusions and the boxes they want to build in order to find God. All appropriate for the time, for their path. Old souls are the ones who are in this room. They've decided they don't need a doctrine. There are millions of old souls all over the earth who believe the same thing without any organization, without any leadership, without any central book or prophet. Now that's quantum. <laughs> that's an old soul. Do you see how these things are changing? Here are my instructions to the new age. I want you to relax. I want you to include the human beings on their prayer rugs to their prophet. I want you to love them as much as you love the one who's sitting next to you. I want you to love the one who's, who's in the Catholic Church as much as you love the one who's next to you. I want you to love the fundamentalist Christian as much as you love the one next to you. And watch what happens to them when you put that out. Old soul, this is in your court. Not theirs. And when you do this, there's going to be a reciprocation of energy. It's going to disarm hate. They will look at you and see God in you and say, how can this be when I was told it couldn't be? I think I'll relax a little. And you're going to see it. And they will still be a fundamentalist or they'll still be a Muslim. 
or a Catholic or a Jew or a Hindu or a Buddhist. But they'll see God in each other. Now, how, can I, how can I explain how I know this is going to happen? And I will tell you the truth because the Pleiadians had the same thing. Do you think for a moment that you can have civilization without this happening? <laughs> it does. And they did. And they solved it. And today, if you could ask them what happened, they would say, we melded into the appreciation of the compassion of the oneness of the Creator. And that's the lesson of what it can be. So go make it happen. And so it is.